Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Reproductions February webinar, Abortion on the Ballot. Um, so excited to have you all. We have a great panel lined up, and this is also the first time that we're using um, closed captions um, through this format. So hopefully it uh, responds well and people can see it. Um, but we'll go ahead and get uh, get into it. All right, so I will introduce myself and then I'll pass it over to my co-host. So I am Jessica Ensley. I'm the Senior Vice President of Outreach here at ReproAction and I'm based in uh, Washington, DC. And Natalie, I'll kick it over to you to introduce yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Natalie Newman. I am the Executive Assistant and Senior Operations Coordinator at ReproAction. I use she, her pronouns and I'm based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Awesome. So here's an overview of our agenda. I'll introduce uh, ReproAction as an organization. We're going to go over abortion on the ballot history and recent wins, and then we'll jump into our wonderful panel that we have here, um, and then we'll go on to next steps and then get to questions and answers at the end. If you have questions as we're going through the panel, please feel free to fill those out, um, and then I'll read them when we get to the Q&A section. And then you can join our conversation by live tweeting using the hashtag ReproAction. All right. So ReproAction leads bold action to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. We have a left flank analysis and we are willing to hold folks on all sides accountable, including those who are allies or opposition, and we are committed to nonviolent direct action. All right, so a little bit about anti-abortion state policy. Um, we have here a screenshot of Guttmacher's wonderful interactive um, state policy tracker. So I'd highly recommend going and checking that out. This screen grab is from this morning. Um, so for 50 years, the anti-abortion movement has worked to overturn Roe v. Wade, and one of their main strategies was to attack abortion access at the state level. After Roe fell, many states enacted trigger laws that automatically banned abortion. A year later, according to a December 2023 Guttmacher report, 14 states are enforcing total bans with limited exceptions, including two new bans enforced this year. So now more than ever, the pro-abortion movement needs to uplift access to care in our own communities and states. All right, and I will pass it over to Natalie to talk about abortion on the ballot wins. Hi again, everyone. Thank you for joining what will be a great discussion. I'm going to dive into abortion on the ballot since Roe v. Wade was overturned in June of 2022. As of November 2022, according to Jezebel, not a single pro-abortion or pro-choice ballot measure or initiative has failed. The seven states that have had sweeping victories for abortion rights are California, Kansas, Kentucky, Vermont, Michigan, Ohio, and Montana. As we know, abortion is popular and it wins. Now I'll go through each win for abortion. In the 2022 midterms, after Roe was overturned, five states all voted for the pro-choice position, and these states are California, Michigan, Kentucky, Montana, and Vermont. California, Vermont, and Michigan all voted to codify abortion rights in the state's constitution. Voters in Montana rejected a ballot measure that would have forced medical workers to intercede in the extremely rare case of a baby born after a, quote, attempted abortion, which does not happen and perpetuates a false narrative. Unfortunately, this did not stop lawmakers from passing a similar version of the law a few months later. Voters in both Kentucky and Kansas voted against an anti-abortion measure in 2022. Amendment 2 would have amended the Kentucky Constitution to say that nothing in the document can be construed to protect abortion rights. Though this did not codify abortion rights, this resounding no keeps the door open for Kentucky's abortion ban to be thrown out in the future. Voters in Kansas defeated an initiative that would have removed the guaranteed right to abortion from the state's constitution and opened the door for a total ban. And as of February 7th, 2024, Virginia lawmakers voted to reject a measure that would have prohibited abortions, except in cases necessary to save the life of the pregnant person. Abortion is still legal up to 28 weeks in Virginia. Next slide, please. 
Colorado Senate Bill 190, called Deceptive Trade Practice Pregnancy Related Service, regulates the de deceptive practices of anti-abortion fake clinics and regulates the unproven and unethical abortion pill reversal, called APR, making it unprofessional conduct. Colorado was the first state in the country to make abortion pill reversal treatment unprofessional conduct with this bill. This monumental bill is tied up in a court battle, which is something I'm sure we'll touch upon in our discussion today. Ohio Issue 1 was a constitutional amendment passed to codify the right to abortion in the state's constitution, making it the seventh state to do so following the overturn of Roe. Though Ohio was the only state to vote directly on abortion access in 2023, other states had wins relating to abortion access, including Virginia and Kentucky. Issue 1 also enshrined the right to make decisions about birth control, miscarriage care, and fertility treatment. Both of these wins could not have been possible without the tireless work and efforts of grassroots organizers on the ground, some of which we'll talk to today. Now, in 2024, there is one state where abortion is directly on the ballot, Maryland. This ballot initiative, like California, Vermont, and Michigan, is asking voters if abortion rights should be enshrined into the state's constitution, though the state already protects abortion under state law. There are many other states where abortion could be on the ballot, including Arizona, Arkansas, Colorado, Florida, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, Nevada, and South Dakota. If you'd like to see where your state is at on codifying abortion rights, go to rewirenews.com and find the abortion ballot tracker. Now I'll pass it back over to Jessica to, in to interview our first panelist. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, I would love to introduce our first panelist, um, Candice Gibson. Uh, she is the Director of State Policy at the Guttmacher Institute, which she joined in 2024. She oversees the Institute's work to advance evidence-based state-level policies to secure sexual and reproductive health and rights. Previously, Ms. Gibson served as the Director of Government Relations at the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice, where she oversaw the organization's federal policy and advocacy efforts. As staff attorney at the National Health Law Program, she created strategies to improve access to and coverage of sexual and reproductive health care for individuals enrolled in Medicaid and private insurance. Prior to attending law school, Ms. Gibson worked with the refugee and immigrant communities to eliminate health inequities at Comunidades Unida, Salt Lake City, Utah. She has a JD from the University of Utah, SJ Quinney College of Law, and received a BA in government and Spanish from Smith College. She was an If One How Reproductive Justice Fellow from 2012 to 2014, and was a New Leaders Council Maryland Fellow in 2020. Welcome, Candice. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thank you, Jessica, for having me and for the entire Repro Action team for inviting me to this conversation. Absolutely. Um, so my first question for you, Candace, is can you dive a little into why focusing on state-level policies is important for our movement as a whole? Uh, yes, that's a great question. So I think, you know, as someone who grew up in Utah and, and worked with advocates and lawmakers at the start of my career, state policies are they're incredible they can be incredibly helpful right uh, they can have a direct impact on people's lives um, and they can also be incredibly harmful um, and i think we you see that uh, you know during these state legislative sessions right that there's there can be an immediate impact um, you know for the communities within those states so i think you know for guttmacher you know from 1973 to 2022 uh, the Guttmacher Institute tracked over 1,300 plus restrictions on abortion care. And we know that these restrictions not only made it difficult, if not impossible, to access abortion care while Roe was the law of the land, but it also got us to this place where we are now, um, you know, facing this abortion crisis post Dobbs. So I think as part of our work, you know, at Guttmacher and the movement, we have to advance policies that are grounded in human rights, right, and based in evidence. Um, but it, particularly for Guttmacher, we also try to examine the impact of these harmful policies. So, you know, one of the biggest questions that, you know, came out of the fallout of Dobbs, really, that, that Guttmacher is, is looking at was whether or how people in states 
that have banned abortion will be able to get the abortion care that they need. Um, so Guttmacher created this monthly abortion provision study that really aims to estimate state by state numbers of abortion provision within the formal healthcare system to really get a, a, a sense or to, to paint a picture of what it would look like uh, when 14 states ban abortion. Um, we, you know, our data shows so far that the proportion of patients traveling to other states to obtain care has doubled. So that's nearly one in five patients in the first half of 2023, uh, compared with one in 10 in 2020. Um, and so I think this type of data then really, you know, demonstrates the urgency to uh, state policymakers in states where abortion is where abortion is legal, that they not only have to think about the legality of, of abortion rights, but they also have to think through what are all the levers that these states can use to ensure that people can get this care within their state, right? That people who are traveling out of state um, can access the care that they need. Um, I also think too, as a, as a movement, uh, you know, states can be incredible hubs for innovation, right? Um, I think they can come up with policy solutions that can then be possibly, you know, um, could then be possibly transferred or possibly even scaled up at the federal level. Um, and we've seen so many, you know, proactive and protective measures in the past two years. Right. I think the last legislative session, we saw some states, you know, taking measures to increase funding to protect patient access to abortion care um, and supporting the health care workforce overall. Uh, you know, during this legislative session so far, we're seeing states really trying to um, increase access to contraception right and codifying the right to contraception. Um, so I'll also end here, too, that I think you know, state policies are um, you know, now more than ever uh, important to really create a bold vision of what sexual and reproductive health care can look like in this country that goes beyond what we had uh, when Roe existed. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Those were some sobering statistics um, and a great reminder, too, that even when Roe was in place, it was the floor and not the ceiling. Um, so it's great to hear um, some more information about um, what states are doing to increase access. Um, so my next question is, previously you've worked at the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice. So what are policy conversations, uh, what policy conversations need to be happening in order to advance healthcare access to Latina and Latinx communities specifically? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Jessica. Uh, I think, so over sort of my course of my advocacy career so far, I, I think this, this question not only speaks for two, or not only speaks to Latina and Latinx communities, but I think all communities that are um, disproportionately harmed or marginalized uh, in the current systems that we have in place. Um, I think that policy conversations can continue to be very much focused on a single issue instead of being uh, people-centered, right? Uh, and particularly centering um, the individuals and communities who are most impacted by these policy conversations. Um, so, you know, at Latin Institute, uh, a lot of my work was thinking through how we include immigrants in the conversations on broader healthcare access, right, but also within sexual and reproductive healthcare, um, and you know, part of that work was um, was thinking through you know federal legislative solutions like the Heal Act. Um, so uh, the Heal Act is a federal bill that would overcome the legal and policy barriers that immigrants face when trying to get coverage in this country. Um, there are also state efforts. Uh, to increase access to health care for immigrants. Um, you know, states are really thinking through what are some of the levers that they have to increase access uh, to coverage for undocumented individuals. Um, so I think, you know, these bills um, not only create a policy solution, but really they also assert a conversation that all people in this country deserve access to health care regardless of whether you're born in this country or not. Um, and I think 
that conversation happens and these policy solutions occur, right, um, when you begin having uh, an intersectional lens to your work and really thinking through, okay, like who are, who are the communities that need to be uh, centered in these conversations and that need to lead to these conversations? Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, and you you have such a wealth of knowledge in all of your um, positions that you've held. And, and so I wanted to ask you, what has surprised you most about um, working for policy change throughout all of these different positions and now as the director of state policy at Guttmacher? I think there's two things that have, I think, su surprised me the most um, when I when I think about this question. So I think first that whether it's, you know, at the local, state, or federal level, there is a tension of, you know, creating the, the world you want, right, the, the creating the vision uh, versus the political realities that you're grappling with. Um, and I think those tensions, um, I can really not only influence the day-to-day -day work, but really determine the resources that are needed to, um, to implement whatever efforts you want to, whether you want to implement an incremental approach uh, or a bold visionary approach to, to uh, policy solutions. Um, and I think my, my, the, second, um, the second point that I also want to make uh, regarding this question is that I don't think policy change uh, operates in silos. Um, I've learned so much from my colleagues in other movement spaces, um, particularly from my colleagues in the LGBTQ uh, rights and liberation space. And so I think regardless of where, um, where our lane is or which sort of you know, policy sector we're working in, we need to have cross-movement conversations and we need to be connecting with um, individuals and groups who are working on different issues, but I think who are also seeing the same sort of parallel trends within their work. Um, and I also think too that we need to learn um, from our peers globally. Uh, that's what's been really exciting during this time is just all the green wave gatherings that have happened across, you know, that have happened over the past couple of years, right? Uh, you know, these convenings are really facilitating cross country learning and connections. Um, and they're sort of vital spaces to be in community with each other, um, but also, you know, to, to learn from our peers in other countries who've, you know, who have faced, you know, the, the situation that we're in now, uh, but have made incredible strides. And I think that's particularly important uh, now that the U.S. is really a, a global outlier on abortion rights. So true that we cannot do this work alone and we have so much to learn from each other. Um, so thank you for, for raising those movements that we can look toward for um, a brighter future. Thank you so much, Candice. Um, we'll come back to you during the Q&A section. Um, and for now, I will pass it over to Natalie for our next panelist. Hi, um, so I'll introduce our next panelist, Lexi dotson Ufault. Lexis is a 25-year-old birthing doula, reproductive justice advocate, and the executive director for Abortion Fund of Ohio. Ohio Statewide Abortion Fund, born in Springfield, Massachusetts, Lexi is a first-generation college student and former foster youth passionate about abolition, Black liberation, and the perseverance through inter intersectional, ge generational trauma, excuse me, with mutual aid, community care, and trauma-informed care. In 2019, she earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Massachusetts, focusing on her studies on educational justice and the school to prison pipeline. Lexi's work in the reproductive justice movement began at a young age, supporting numerous family members, friends, and community members through pregnancies and postpartum, many of whom were experiencing state-sanctioned violence and familial separation. In 2019, she participated in the Reproductive Rights and Activist Service Corps program at Hampshire College, leading her to intern, volunteer, then later join the board of directors of AFO. Lexi is also the co-coordinator for Abortion Access with Advocate for Youth, where she works to ensure medication abortion is accessible in students at all public universities in Massachusetts. 
She's a storyteller with We Testify, where she shares her abortion story in an effort to destigmatize and strengthen support for young people's access to abortion. She enjoys catering to her cat shug, trying various sweet treats, and listening to Megan Thee Stallion. And I um, also love listening to Megan Thee Stallion. Um, so welcome, Lexi. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey y'all, thanks so much for having me. I'm so grateful to be here and be part of this conversation with y'all. Yeah, definitely. So I'll just jump right into our questions. So my first question for you is how did the work of Black women and femmes impact this win in Ohio? I would say, you know, the main thing is it's more than just voting and mobilizing for one election. Um, you know, the work that black women and um, brown or black and brown organizers have been doing um, is really building a movement, um, especially of those, you know, those of us who have had abortions. You know, we've been here for years and years and years, you know, building power for abortion access. Um, this didn't start right when Roe fell. Um, and, and that's what we saw. We saw, you know, a lot of you know, people that weren't really doing the work beforehand pop up when Roe fell and you've just been like, you know, y'all haven't been listening to us. You know, we've been saying this for years and we've been trying to, you know, do this pre-work. So, you know, it doesn't get to this or when it does get to this, you know, we're ready. Um, and, you know, the work that was done by Black you know, Reproductive Justice Organizer from funding abortion, knocking doors, was really essential for this win. Um, I think in you know the reproductive rights, reproductive health, you know movement, there is a huge disparity between those leading the movement and those who are most impacted by abortion bans, um, complications from pregnancies, and other barriers to care. Um, and those are you know black women, those are our trans folks, those are young people, those are disabled people, those are people that are being most impacted by these barriers, by these bans, um, and yet we are consistently not given, you know, tables and seats at the table. We are constantly not being listened to. We are constantly being undermined. Um, and I think, you know, the main, you know, distinction is that a lot of, you know, Black women and brown or uh, brown women and organizers, we are we're focusing on reproductive justice, you know, the right to have a child, the right not to have a child, the right to raise your family, you know, whatever that may look like, whatever your family may look like in safe and healthy environments. And we're intentionally focusing on intersectionality and we're intentionally focusing on, you know, prioritizing the voices of the most marginalized. Um, and, you know, that's what black organizers prioritize. We prioritize doing outreach to communities of color, um, focusing on young people, focusing on people who are living in poverty, focusing on our trans folks and disabled folks, um, you know, people who are actively accessing abortion care. You know, these are the people that support us. These are the people that are, you know, aligned with us. You know, we need, you know, these are the people that are actively facing the worst, you know, barriers and the worst outcomes of being denied care um and i i think just very much we we look on moderate vote uh moderate swing voters um and we're, we're focused on messaging to them and uh you know catering to them when we need to be giving our base the people that truly support us something to really turn out for um abortion fund of ohio you know, we are focused primarily on direct service um, and our work in supporting patients and destigmatizing access to abortion care really laid the foundation for issue one to pass. Last year, we talked to over 4,500 people, the majority of those being black, uh, black and brown people who are experiencing income insecurity. Um, and, you know, just in speaking with them, you know, a lot of people didn't know this was happening or didn't, you know, know that this special election was going on that they tried to throw. Um, and, you know, and having conversations with people like, you know, I, I can't believe this is happening. Like, it's so unfair that, you know, they're trying to control my body. Oh, yeah. Did you know, you know, we're having an election to make sure that, you know, we get abortion protected and like having those just conversations, you know, people care about things that impact them. Um, so they hear that and they're like, oh my gosh, tell me more. Like, what, what are you even talking about? And, you know, having those one-to-one -one conversations, um, you know, I, growing up, I 
didn't learn much about, you know, voting. I didn't learn much about policies. Um, and, you know, the more I learned about those, you know, just from having conversations with people, the more involved I got, especially, you know, in things that directly impacted me. Um, and, you know, while campaigns have the short term goal of passing initiatives, you know, it's black led orgs and black patients who have to live and provide and receive care post election. Um, and so, you know, when we're having these campaigns and stuff, we really, really need to be, you know, concerned and looking at the stigma that we might be perpetuating. Um, and so, yeah, with Abortion Fund of Ohio, you know, our work is happening regardless of a campaign, um, regardless of legality, because, you know, barriers are still in place. Um, it is not easy to access abortion care, even in a state where it might be legal. Um, and I think it's really important that campaigns start incorporating these voices into their messaging. Um, in terms of, you know, voting, Ohio Women's Alliance, one of the only Black-led reproductive justice organizations in the state, they ran the biggest field program. Um, they reached out to over 1.3 million voters, pr primarily young people, um, BIPOC people across the state. And, you know, exit polls showed that these efforts were essential. Um, and, you know, when it came time, 60% of female voters, 83% of black voters and 77% of voters under the age of 30 voted yes on that issue. Um, and that is directly because of the intentional work that Ohio Women's Alliance did to reach out to these groups of people. They were being forgotten. They were not being prioritized by these, you know, white led legacy orgs with millions and millions of dollars to do this work. That work was laid on the backs of a very, very small um, black led organization. Um, and, you know, with that, you know, black and brown communities are consistently labeled as, you know, disenfranchised, you know, group that doesn't come out to vote, isn't interested in these types of issues. And that's not true. You know, issue one showed that is not the case. Um, when you give black and brown voters, when you give young people, when you give marginalized groups something real and tangible to vote on, um, we show out because we know, you know, what is best for ourselves and our families, and we are going to vote for policies that make that a reality. Wow, thank you so much for all of that. That was very extensive, and it's just just goes to show how much love and care was put into this win, and especially just with the Abortion Fund of Ohio, I know abortion funds are just fantastic um, in general, so I know you guys have a lot to do and not so much support, so I just am really proud of the work that you guys do um, at the Abortion Fund of Ohio, and it just sounds like you all put so much time and effort into this, so I really commend you all for that. Um, so I guess my next question is, did messaging really have an impact on the um, ballot measure? And if so, how so? Absolutely. <laughs> messaging has an impact on everything. Um, and when I first, first saw this question, you know, I just thought about, you know, my first abortion. Um, when I had my first abortion, um, before I was, you know, involved in this work, um, I, I was going to continue my pregnancy because of the messaging that I had heard about abortion my whole life. I grew up in a very, you know, conservative home, very religious home where abortion was not spoken about. I attended a private Catholic school um, from kindergarten until I graduated high school, and I never had a sex ed class. I never even had a health class. Um, so, you know, I had never heard, you know, positive narratives about abortion or even normalized narratives about abortion. And it wasn't until I actually heard, um, Another abortion storyteller who, uh, Jordan Close, she's the deputy director of Ohio Women's Alliance, and I heard her talk about her abortion, and she was like, yeah, it was cool, it was normal, um, I did it, it was great, and I couldn't, you know, I have no regrets. And I heard that at a conference, and I went out to my car while I was pregnant and made an appointment at the abortion clinic because th that is what I needed to hear. I just needed someone, you know, I needed that messaging. It is normal. It's okay to have an abortion. You're not doing anything wrong. So, you know, when you think about that on just like a one person level, you know, you have to apply that to, you know, a greater, you know, a greater reason, like a 
that messaging is impactful. Um, you know, storytelling is impactful, and it has a huge role in how voters see abortion and the issue itself. And there was a lot of messaging at play in this initiative that black and brown organizers and abortion storytellers did not support. Um, and we had to do a lot of work to make the messaging, you know, as inclusive and pro-abortion as possible. We consistently heard narratives, um, you know, stigmatizing rhetoric like reasonable women, lowering the abortion rates, um, not that many abortions. Um, and, you know, a lot of stories focused around rape, incest, you know, childhood sexual assault, which are all very valid stories. But that is not the norm. That is not why the majority of people are accessing abortion care. And so why are we focusing our narrative narratives around that? The majority of Americans support abortion access. So why are we you know, following so much respectability politics to make other people comfortable. Um, you know, we need to be talking about abortion without stigma. You know, the, this line of messaging doesn't end when the elections are over. Um, we have to be doing deep destigmatization work, you know, in our communities. Um, and with our messaging, you know, I think black and brown organizers really try to focus on intersectionality. Like this is about abortion, but it's also more than that. You know, this is about, and this is what I'm talking about when, when I'm talking about intersectionality and like making sure that is the focus of our work. Like, you know, it's about abortion, but it's also about maternal health rates. It's about criminalization. It's about housing. It's about our environment. It's about all these different things that are impacting us and, you know, following reproductive justice, impacting how we live our lives and can we live our lives safely. And abortion is, is a key component of that. Um, so, you know, talking about all these different things, you know, when we have access to a full spectrum of, you know, health, reproductive health care services, social services, um, you know, our communities get better. So we worked closely, you know, with the ballot committee to ensure that language was as inclusive as possible. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to note that there were only two Black-led organizations represented in the coalition. Um, you know, the, e the executive director of OWA was the only Black woman on the executive committee for the campaign. Um, you know, if Black people and people of color, um, you know, if we are not represented in rooms and advocating for ourselves, how will, you know, how do people understand what we actually need? You know, we don't need people talking for us. We need to be talking for us. Um, you know, I think, you know, I take a lot of pride in being a young Black leader, you know, as someone who's had multiple abortions and has experienced many of the barriers um, that people reaching out to AFO are also facing, I feel like, you know, I'm able to speak for my communities, to speak for people, you know, needing to access care. Obviously, I cannot speak for everyone, but I am speaking for a large population of people that are reaching out to us for help. Um, and that feels good. And, you know, making sure that, you know, my team, my direct service facing team, you know, are also young Black women who have had abortions. That's important to me. It's important that the people reaching out to us feel like they can connect with the person helping them, feel like they're being understood, feel like they're not being judged. Um, that's really important to me. The conversations, you know, messaging between one or two people or millions of people, it doesn't matter. It's all very important. It's a very you know, impactful, and we have to be very conscious about the way that we are speaking about abortion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, it's definitely, like, talking about abortion stigma, like, there's just so much more work to be done after something is put into place, like you said. So it's just um, a good reminder to be like, okay, I'm glad we got this done, but now there's even more work to be done. Like, the work is never over. Um, so I guess this kind of leads into my next and final question, um, and you kind of already talked about this, but what work can and should be done in the wake of this win and just for abortion access going forward? Yeah, um, the work is far from done. Trying to relish in our win, but also the work is very far from done. Um, you know, housing issue one is not the end all be all. Um, I don't necessarily believe that there's anything such as a haven state. Um, because, you know, there's still restrictions, there's still barriers 
to people accessing care. Um, yeah, there's some restrictions in our bill that we have to fight. We have to fight, you know, viability clauses. Those are BS. You don't need those. Um, there's still medically unnecessary restrictions and guidelines that clinic uh, clinics and practitioners must follow. Um, there's a lack of abortion clinics and later care abortion providers. You know, yes, I'm so ecstatic to have you know, we have our win, but, you know, the clinics that we have in Ohio right now aren't even enough to support Ohioans, never mind, you know, Indiana and Kentucky and West Virginia, you know, states that we have absolved a lot of, you know, people needing care um, because those states do not have access. Um, so really you need to support our clinics, especially our independent clinics. Um, and like I said, we have serious destigmatizing work to do. Um, you know, I don't want traumatic abortion cases to be the poster story for abortion. Like I said, those are very true and valid experiences, but that is not the reality, you know, of the majority of people having abortions. I want the language to be, you know, I just, you know, I'm having an abortion because I don't want to have a kid. Like that should be just as valid as someone saying, you know, I was raped and I don't want to, you know, I want an abortion all abortions are very valid and equally necessary. Um, so we don't have to, you know, focus our language around, you know, this tra traumatic lens because it doesn't, it, it's not that way for everyone. Um, and yeah, you know, there is no such thing as reasonable limits to abortion care. You know, there's not a single legal restriction on abortion rooted in health or safety, um, any barrier, or ban that impacts any abortion, regardless of the situation or gestation, gestational age, you know, we have to contend that. Um, you know, in my perfect world, there is an all trimester abortion clinic in your neighborhood. Um, you know, access to abortion care does nothing but, you know, better our lives and improve our communities. So we need to do all the things necessary to make that possible. And that'll begin with really listening to people who are having abortions. Mm hmm exactly. So everything you said is just so true. Um, thank you so much for this discussion. You have been brilliant and we're so lucky to have you. Um, thank you so much, Lexi, we really appreciate it. Thanks, you um, And I'll pass it back over to Jessica. Awesome. Thank you, Natalie and Lexi. Um, with that, um, I'll take a brief second to remind folks if they have questions to please enter them in and we'll, we'll get to them at the end of this webinar. Um, and for now, we're gonna move on to our um, last but not least panelist of today, Ariana Morales, um, the organizing director at New Era Colorado. Um, she has worked for over five years with the organization to destigmatize abortion across major college campuses in Colorado, pass innovative statewide policy to protect young people from deceptive anti-abortion centers, and now runs the redesigned organizing department at New Era to pass a statewide pro-abortion access, excuse me, access ballot measure by mobilizing young people to vote with their values. Welcome, Ariana. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk with you all today and I really appreciate the invitation. Of course, we appreciate your time. Um, my first question for you is how does working to destigmatize abortion care on college campuses impact policy conversations in Colorado? Yeah, so I'll start off by saying that the entire mission at New Era Colorado and our entire philosophy revolves around this idea that young people have the revolutionary potential to create change and change things in ways that maybe we can't even see right now. Um, and so it feels so important to us that young people are a part of these conversations. So I think the work that we've done on a, uh, to destigmatize abortion on college campuses was really important to us. We started it in 2016 with our then fellowship program called the Brazen Project, um, which essentially was at some of our major universities across Colorado and hosted uh, cohorts of three to four organizers who were students at each of these campuses to really talk to their peers about abortion. Um, 
at the like root of it, that was really the hope and mission is that young people could be supported through trainings on abortion messaging, the history of abortion, the intersectionality of abortion, to feel comfortable to talk to their peers about it um, and get their peers involved as well. And uh, as a young person who grew up in a traditionally Catholic Latina, Latine, Latino household, um, it was really life-changing for me to start as an organizer here at New Era and talk about or lead groups to talk about abortion when maybe I didn't even feel that comfortable doing so. Um, I think I really felt the ramifications as a young person of feeling like this was a taboo topic. This was something that people should feel nervous to talk about. And I also, as someone who had a really close family member have an abortion, who to this day has only told three people, including me, um, that they had an abortion. And it was, I think that was maybe the cause of a lot of the stigmatization that I felt as a young person has seen past generations deal with this generational trauma of not feeling like they could talk comfortably about the choices they made with their body. Um, and I'm, and I know that that is also maybe the root of this for some young people, but generally what we were noticing is that the culture on campus, just like on college campuses, just didn't promote the ability to be able to talk about people's abortions openly and without shame. And so, um, that's why we named the Brazen Project, the Brazen Project. We believe that people should be able to talk about their abo abortion and their support for abortion, and also just generally their support for reproductive health care boldly and without shame. Um, and so I think that the biggest part of this is you can't, young people can't dream up new possibilities for access to reproductive health care if they don't even feel comfortable talking about the current barriers for re reproductive health care. Um, and over the like five years that we led this program, it was transformational to watch young people have a space on campus to be able to talk about their own abortion. Um, and also there may be complicated feelings about their support for abortion. We often heard and there were there was tons of data that showed that young people were in majority support of abortion, um, but didn't feel comfortable labeling themselves um, one way or the other. And so what we really hoped is not that people felt like this had to be an identity that they held um, with just one label, but that it was a issue um, that they were able to talk about, learn about, and then come to a consensus about based on their values and their community. And so, um, yeah, I mean, young people are such a impacted demographic when it comes to reproductive health care um, that often people talk about, but people don't include young people in these conversations. So being able to destigmatize abortion on college campuses allowed young people to have a say in the conversation about what was their experience, what were the barriers, and how could we meet the challenges they were facing. Um, and I think that's the only way the policy should happen. Um, I believe full-heartedly as someone who is a former policy person that unless you are organizing and actually asking people what their experience are or is that you can't create effective a policy with or effective policy without that um so yeah i think that's why it's really important that we we make sure that we just stigmatize abortion before having some of these policy conversations absolutely um storytelling work is so very important um and thank you thank you for sharing that um, my next question for you is, you helped advocate for a statewide policy to protect young people from deceptive anti-abortion fake clinics. Can you give an overview as to how that win came to fruition? Yeah, that was actually uh, years of organizing um, to first be able to even talk about that policy. Um, I think a lot of folks from different states here might know, but this is true, obviously, for Colorado as well, that anti-abortion centers make up such a huge percentage of centers across Colorado. They out or uh, in the states, they outnumber in Colorado abortion, like actual reproductive health care centers, three to one, um, and are often found in areas where we lack abortion health care centers as well. So in rural communities and communities outside of the major front range here in Colorado. Um, this was this was an issue that we heard first about from young people on college campuses. At every college campus we were at, there was an anti-abortion center either on the college campus as a student group or near the college campus within like half a mile. 
um, at our campus in Fort Collins. It was across the street from campus. They advertised on campus. In our uh, college campus in Boulder here in Colorado, they were advertising themselves in coupon books um, that all of the new students got when they first started um, for free services that they already provided. Um, so from our organizing work that we were doing on college campuses, we heard some confusion, a lot of confusion from young people about what these centers were. Um, but more than that, we heard a lot of stories of folks who were going to these centers um, and finding themselves feeling trapped and uncertain about what services they actually provided. Um, so, I mean, it, it took a lot of work, but over the years that we were doing organizing on college campuses, we were actually able to pass student legislation with student government at the three major universities that we were organizing at. Um, so student government came out and said that they were not supportive of these anti-abortion centers and that they wouldn't condone the actions of misleading students on college campuses. Um, from there on out, this was a major conversation that us and several of our partners here in Colorado knew was an issue for young people, but also people of color, um, black folks, people in um, immigrant communities um, where they often would advertise their services. Um, and so thankfully us and our fabulous partners over at Color, who are a reproductive justice organization here in Colorado, um, decided to take on a statewide policy based on some learnings that we saw across the country with different states attempting to also um, pass policy against anti-abortion centers, um, while also trying to get to the root of what the issue was here for our constituents or the people that we served, which was a thousand percent just a confusion and misleading of what services they actually provided. Um, so we were able to pass statewide policy with our partners while also being a part of a package that generally protected health care um, as well as um, trans and LGBTQ rights in Colorado um, and have been on a journey since then to we need to understand uh, what it meant to um, help organize or organize around medical boards and part of our policy um, kind of transitioned to the medical boards to see um, if they would hold up that uh, abortion pill reversal was unprofessional conduct for people to provide. Um, and thankfully, with a lot of organizing and a lot of storytellers that came out and spoke out abortion pill, about abortion pill reversal um, and the dangers of abortion pill reversal, were able to get the medical boards to say it was unprofessional conduct. Um, that's all being held up in court right now. Um, so we've done our work to advocate from an organizer's uh, and policy-wide stance, and now we're just hoping that, um, yeah, the courts feel the same. But a big portion of the work that we did was through organizing, both um, here at New Era and with our partners over at Colorado. Awesome. Thank you very much for sharing that. As someone who's first um, encountered an anti-abortion fake clinic also right next to my college campus through their sign that just said free pregnancy tests and the horror stories mm -hmm. that my friends went through. I, I, <laughs> um, it is, um, uh, both heartbreaking that it is still happening. Um, of course, in that they, they of course target young and vulnerable people. Um, but wonderful that organizations like yours exist to, um, educate and advocate, um, for those folks and to put the, the leadership into the students' hands. Um, so that's wonderful. And thank you for giving us an update on where that policy stands. Um, my last question for you is, what can other states take away from um, successes that Colorado has had in abortion policy? Mm, I love this question. Um, yeah, I mean, Colorado isn't, the only state that's not unique in that we have thankfully been able to really protect abortion at at a legal status right like we've created a lot of protections through policy to protect abortion care in colorado not only for people in the state but also for people traveling out of the state who receive abortion care in colorado so um we've done a lot of work and our coalition here in colorado has worked for over 15 years, more than that, to um, continue to protect abortion care through passing progressive policies, but also ensuring that um, anti-abortion policies don't uh, 
don't win, aren't successful. Um, I think what folks could take away from a lot of the work that we've done in Colorado is one, to not get complacent in the fact that even in our state where abortion care is legal, um, that the work is done. I think um, I've heard our other panelists really talk about this, but it's so important to remind ourselves that that does it just because abortion is legal doesn't mean that it's accessible to everyone. Um, and that's something that we very much understand here in Colorado. And now with the foundation that we do have of um, having it uh, abortion protected legally, um, what can we do to either further protect that um, or expand access? And I think the way we've been thinking about this is um, young people don't currently fully have access to abortion care without restrictions. Um, obviously, there are challenges such as anti-abortion centers um, who exist uh, in areas of high density for young people, but also um, we have parental notification law here in Colorado that makes it so young people um, who are under 18 can't access abortion care without their parents being notified, which could be an issue for a lot of young people who don't have close or trusted relationships with their parents um, or don't have a relationship generally with their parents. Um, there's also challenges to abortion care for incarcerated folks. I mean, we have some lovely partners here in Colorado who are really working um, to ensure that incarcerated folks get access to equitable health care, um, but it's not something that is often brought up in the conversation around abortion care, but reproductive health care generally. And so I just want to shout out Elephant Circle and Soul to Soul Sisters who've been doing incredible work here in Colorado to ensure that, you know, we are thinking about the full spectrum of reproductive health care. Um, and that looks like everyone getting the uh, ability to access that. Um, other than that, too, I think something that we do really well is organize the people who are impacted by this issue to take action on this issue. Um, a huge part of our mission here in New Era, too, is that not only are we uh, ensuring that young people are leading this conversation, um, but the young people have the resources they need to be able to have these conversations, too. Um, and that looks like knowing how to be civically engaged, whether that's voting for some folks. Some folks feel like voting is that tool in their toolbox for them. Um, but also that looks like testifying at the state capitol. There's so much that you can do at uh, your local government, so ensuring that they know how their local government works and what they can ask for from the budget of their local government. Um, so there's a lot that can be done aside from statewide policy that I think is important for people to know too, and just understanding like where power exists and how you can utilize that power. And the last thing I'll say is that, I mean, we continue the work to protect abortion here in Colorado. And um, currently we are gathering petitions for Initiative 89, which um, will hopefully be on the ballot to ensure that all Coloradans have access to reproductive health care, no matter their insurance. Um, and this will be protected through the state constitution. So currently right now in Colorado, um, people who are state employees don't have access to abortion care through their insurance, insurance um, which is a huge barrier for folks who um, wouldn't otherwise be able to afford an abortion if that is the health care that they need. So that is work that we're doing this year to ensure that all people can access this. Um, yeah, and I think it's, it's really important to keep reminding ourselves that there's always more to be done and all we have to do is ask the people who are affected by this issue. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ariana, um, for your time and your thoughtful answers um, and for all the work that you do in your experience. Um, so I'm just going to go to some housekeeping items. Um, so plug in future reproaction campaigns at reproaction.org and you can follow us on social media. And please save the date for our next webinar, which is going to be no, no Borders, No Walls, Abortion Care for All. And that's going to take place Wednesday, March 20th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All right. And then we're going to get into the questions. Um, so I'm going to pass it to any of the panelists who want to take this, but how can the reproductive justice movement, this question is from Jasmine, um, how can the reproductive justice movement address abortion protecting quote unquote state ballot measures like the one proposed in Arkansas that still contain abortion limits or offer fewer protections than Roe? 
But Jessica, thanks for the for the question, and I, thanks Jasmine for the question as well. I don't think I have a, I don't think I have an answer here. Um, you know, but I would say I think we to have these are very difficult conversations, right? Um, and I do think from you know the perspective of of my work, it's always been trying to listen to the folks on the ground who are leading these conversations, right? Um, and to really you know to really you know support what individuals are trying to do at the ground level. Um, I don't know if other panelists or, or, or organizers have have thoughts on this. Um, my volume was cutting out, so I missed some of it, but I'll just say, yeah, it is a super hard conversation. I don't know if I even have the answer. Um, I don't think I do, but I think a lot of it comes down to having to do a lot of the deep, destigmatizing, you know, conversations in the community um, because, you know, people, a lot of people, you know, don't feel comfortable even talking about abortion. Um, there is so much rhetoric out there and so much misinformation out there that, you know, people, you know, hear third trimester abortion and their mind goes to a whole different place. Um, of what you know it could be which it actually isn't um so i think having you know these conversations with people and you know share uplifting stories you know about people who are having you know abortions you know in the third trimester and you know beyond what these limits are setting um and really prioritizing those stories makes a huge difference in you know the you know, getting a ballot initiative that doesn't have those limitations on it. Yeah, I would tend to agree. I mean, I don't um, want to answer as if I know the landscape of Arkansas in terms of what their organizing looks like with organizations in Arkansas. Um, but what I can say is that this is like a real conversation that I think happens um, in every state where folks are organizing together across um, in coalition with each other that, um, yeah, it's really hard to sometimes get on the same page about uh, what, what we actually should be fighting for and also what does it mean to take like or have little successes and does that actually push back the, the goals for some organizations? I think it's a conversation even here in Colorado that we've worked really hard to get on the same page about across um, just abortion advocacy groups and reproductive justice organizations. Um, what, yeah, what does the work look like and what should we be prioritizing? So I don't wanna answer as if I know what's going on in Arkansas, but I tend to agree with what, um, Lexia said here that we had had a ballot measure in 2020 that specifically targeted abortion later in pregnancy. And um, something that we realized pretty quickly was that these were stories that often weren't being told. Um, and they were stories that because they weren't being told because of the stigma around them were being utilized by um, anti-abortion folks to try to pass this ballot measure. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it's important to tell those stories and it's important to understand the like realities of what people who get abortion space, which looks like having unique and different experiences that never look the same. Um, so I think, yeah, I, that would be my answer to this. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Um, I think we're at uh, almost time, so we won't have time for any more questions. Apologies if you had submitted and we didn't get to them. Um, I just want to take a moment to uh, thank everyone for attending and thank you so much to Candace and Lexi and Ariana for bringing your expertise forward. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you all so much. The work that you do is incredible um, and we really appreciate you um, sharing everything that you have with us today. So thank you. All right, everybody have a wonderful day.